Okay, we're live, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you everybody for being here. Look, everybody's looking bright and chipper on this beautiful day. Probably the earliest Senate Act Committee meeting we've had. Uh, so let's go ahead and do a roll call. Senator Bouchard. Here. Senator French. Here. Senator Cost. Here. Senator Wasserberger. Here. Chairman Boner. Here. Mr. Chairman, all are present. Okay. First bill we have is a Select Water Committee bill, House Bill 2. Uh, we have Chairman Simpson here to explain the bill. And uh, anybody he wants to bring up to support, uh, take it away, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gosh, it's nice to be in front of you folks. You do such efficient work. You knocked off early today and we're still up in session. So thanks for allowing me an excuse to bug out and to be here with you. Um, the state engineer's office is en route. They should be here. So I'm gonna start with the explanation of the bill, if I may. So folks, let me give you a, a grand picture of what's been happening that we're trying to resolve with this bill. So let's say a developer on the edge of town or somewhere near a town decides to develop his acreage. So let's say it's a 40 acre parcel. And so um, he proceeds with the process, whether in the town or in the county, and gets ready to go. It, both the town and the county have regulations to manage water rights. The town is towns and cities are really actually very soft. The county requires the developer to make a decision. So there's four different things he can do with the water rights. And he, they make him make a decision and they submit the application to either the state engineer's office or the board of control. But it never requires them to follow through. So they submit the required paperwork and then they proceed to, to subdivide and they get all done and get their final plat, and then all of a sudden start selling lots and, and no follow through has ever happened. So this is called an orphan water right because it has, the land has water rights, but lot number 22 can never use the water because the ditch or the pipe is several hundred yards away from him. And so the challenge is after seven years, um, any downstream user, including our downstream states, can file for abandonment because that water right isn't used. What we prefer for the developer to do is to either transfer the water rights to the municipality because probably those people are going to start drinking water out of the community water system or put in a conveyance system, either pipes or ditches, so they literally bring the water right back to the lot if, if these are two acre lots, they certainly could utilize that water right in ir ir irrigating their acreage or even smaller lots could irrigate gardens and lawns as a secondary irrigation system. So that's the crutch of it. We have too many orphan water rights in our state that are just being abandoned or just ignored. And as things continue to dry up around the region, we're really worried about losing some high priority territorial water rights that are just simply not being able to be utilized. So that's the crutch of what we have here. And I would be happy, Mr. Chairman, to go into a little more detail if you desire me to. Okay, so open your bill. So let's start on page two. And Mr. Chairman, I'm joined with the esteemed new state engineer. We congratulate him for his new assignment. It's always a pleasure to be sitting next to him. And uh, I'm so excited for him being our new state engineer. He's a great, great addition to our staff. Okay, on page two. So here, this first set of the sections is all about towns and cities. This is in their statute, section 15. And so here on line 12, we're saying that the intended disposition of the water rights, so they have to get approval. Oh, so, I'm sorry, I left a critical issue. So this, this bill makes those developers file for the water right adjustments and finalize it. 
So the state engineer's office or the board of control actually fixes the problem. They adjudicate or abandon the water right, whatever the developer chooses to do, but it's a done deal before final plat. That's the real crutch of the matter here. We're making them finalize it before they get final plat. So here on page two on, on uh, line A, so I've talked about four options. This is the first one. You can see the words on line 18, voluntarily abandon the water rights. If a, a farmer has water rights on a 40 acres, but he's developing it, he has the right to file with the state and say, I'm abandoning those water rights. They're gone. That's an option. It's not a good option for us, but it is an option. On the next page, page three, B says, here's, here's the next option. Um, that says you can transfer the water rights to the city or town. That is the best option for our state. Item C is uh, they can actually lay pipes to the lots and show how they're going to distribute the water rights to every individual lot. That's a great option too. Or you notice on line 19 says, or the fourth option is to detach the water rights pertinent to the lands and transfer them to another parcel. So if I have two 40 acre parcels, one that has water rights and one that doesn't, I and I want to develop the one that does, I can transfer those water rights to my next other parcel and beneficially use them the two. So all viable options. So those are the four concepts we're requiring. So be so starting on page four, line four. Uh, we have a little different concept and that says if the subdivision is located within land served by a ditch so let's say we have a ditch traveling through but they do not pull water rights off of it it's just a a method to get the water downhill to someone else okay we're having challenges with subdivision plats because gosh if, if i buy lot number 22 and there's a ditch that flows through my backyard I can dam that up and I can start pumping out of it and start doing fountains in my backyard. There's a lot of uh, misinformation that can develop when people start buying plats. And so what we're saying here in, in uh, the rest of this page is that we're requiring the subdivider to uh, communicate with the irrigation companies and, and find out is there a pump station involved and what is the pump station do we need access to the pump station all those kind of questions can be asked and then on the last paragraph there in four talks in my mind that's about plat warnings to the lot owners that you may or may not have water rights out of that ditch you have to respect that and not dam the ditch up and allow the water to flow so it just more coordination is required by the subdivider and the irrigation company. So I'm now on page five, room numeral four. If the subdivision is located within the boundary of an irrigation district. So again, we have to, uh, we're requiring that they get together with the irrigation company and they resolve any conflicts. And uh, the developer has to put forth a good faith effort. That's all we're requiring. There's no mandatory. He doesn't have to do what the irrigation company's asking, but there's a, they have to demonstrate to the planning and zoning board that there was a good faith effort there to try to resolve any potential conflicts. So I'm now on page five, Roman numeral five. Okay, if the subdivision is going to pose a significant additional burden or risk of liability to the public entity, so this is a really challenge where the owner shall provide adequate responsible plan to reduce or eliminate additional let's say we have a large um, canal like we see up up in the basin and and there's a massive drop structure right in the middle of this parcel to be developed uh, we're talking about serious risks and liabilities and this paragraph talks about how the owner of the property and the irrigation company work together and the owner has to submit a plan to planning and zoning saying, demonstrating that he is, um, there's a plan in place to try to mitigate any potential risks. Okay, that's a lot. Mr. Chairman, the, 
on page six, the exact same thing. So you've just got the crutch of this whole bill. Now we have to do the same thing in the next chapter, which is chapter 18 for the counties. So I'm not gonna belabor that because it's just reiterates the same thing that I've just shared with you. And then we do it again in one more section. That's why this bill is rather lengthy. On page 11, existing requirements for large acreage subdivisions. So we reiterate the same thing all over again. So there's three statutes. We just have to say it in three different locations. And let me make sure there's nothing at the very end of this bill. I don't believe there's anything important other than just typical language at the very end. Mr. Chairman, before we open questions, may I at, turn the time over to the state engineer and let him uh, have a chance to address anything I either left out or said erroneously. So, and then we'll entertain questions. Yep, sounds good. Director, feel free to fill in any any uh, gaps you feel necessary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, I believe that uh, Board of Control, our superintendent, uh, Dave Schroeder, might be online, and he spent a lot more time working on this bill than I have, so he may be more appropriate to make any additional uh, comments. Yeah, sounds good. We'll go ahead and let him in now. While we do that, I guess, the committee, uh, any questions for Representative Simpson at this point? Senator French. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative, on uh, page 11, uh, uh, line four, the requirements for large acreage subdivision. Would will you could you elaborate on that? It's, you're not talking about a major subdivision. You're, are you talking about the eight, the size of the uh, lots? I mean, uh, the acreage. Six. Line four. Uh, Line eighteen five three sixteen. Requirements for large acreage subdivision permits. Are they talking a major subdivision or a anything above thirty five acres? Because currently anything above thirty five acres is exempt from uh, county uh, 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 subdivision process. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> so. 18-5-316 is an existing uh, statute. And so I'm not sure about your, your question if this statute refers to large gross acres or if it's referring to lot sizes. I don't know the answer to that. Perhaps one of you can, can shed some light on that. I, uh, Mr. Chairman. Well, the county, I know in our county, we had uh, three subdivision rankings, uh, um, um, simple subdivision that was less than two lots, a minor three to five in uh, lots, and then major five and uh, above. We didn't discuss anything that was 35 acres or above. Is this bringing in those acreages that have 30? Five acres and above. Mr. Chairman, as you understand, the way we work is we lift out, leave out huge sections and don't reprint them inside of bills. And we're going to have to turn to section 18 5 316 for the definition of large lot subdivisions. Sorry, I'm not prepared to answer that question. Okay. Yeah, we could uh, look that up here. Is, uh, maybe we have Mr. Uh, Schroeder, uh, provide some testimony if that's okay with you, Senator French. We'll, we'll look up that answer right now. Okay. Like I will. Really. So, okay. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, Schroeder. Good afternoon, members of the committee, Mr. Chairman. My name is David Schroeder. I'm the superintendent of Water Division 2, located in Sheridan, also a member of the Wyoming Board of Control. Uh, I'll keep this brief. I know you have a lot on your plate. Uh, orphan water rights are a significant issue in Wyoming. Given my position, I witness and deal with these almost every day. 
For instance, today I received an email from the NRCS in Buffalo asking for guidance on an unfortunate issue. Uh, the NRCS was consulted by a landowner who has a water right, but the ditch that served his property was severed and removed by the adjacent subdivision, as this was not required under Title 15 when that subdivision was developed. Uh, the true, and I want to thank Representative Simpson for his uh, introduction of this bill. I know he's had a large hand in it. Uh, as I see it, the true intent of this bill is to prevent orphan water rats from occurring going forward. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions or concerns you have uh, in support of our new state engineer. Uh, and I would turn the floor over to anyone else. Okay, sounds good. And to answer that question, it looks like the definition of large um, uh, parcels between 35 and 140 acres, I believe that that's in the green books there. So, uh, Senator Bouchard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, I'm trying to figure out how a a ditch, I mean, from what I just heard, gets gets covered up and on, on, a, on a property maybe next door. How did we not get an easement recorded in the first place? Where that wouldn't happen, or I mean, even even when a property is sold, that's there should be an addendum on that. You know, so somewhere it's it's getting missed all the way in back, the beginning of that when that property transfers. If there's not an addendum on that, on the on the on the sales contract, and then it goes in as a recorded easement on the property. So I want to make sure that if there, there's got to be rulemaking in somewhere, even that's not it's not even needed in this bill that there's a step being missed here. So I want to make sure we. Chairman Simpson, go ahead. That's really a good point. So as we go through the process of buying and selling land, um, as you understand the, the process there, the title company is going to pull down all the easements that are recorded in the county. But if a ditch does not have easements on it, that um, company is not going to find it. And if they haven't visited the site, which they rarely do, so all of a sudden there's going to be a ditch wandering through the property in terms of just a sale that's never going to be discovered during that sale process. Now, during the platting process, it's, it's irresponsible for a, a, a surveyor engineer that's platting that knows very well because they literally draw that ditch through the plat them not to identify an easement and quantify it's usually 10 feet on each side of the ditch or 15 feet on each side of the ditch so during the platting process it typically is caught by the professionals and even if there's nothing in writing at least at that time it's quite often identified and at least even though there's no e written easements it's identified on the plat which is a legal document so from there we're safe Follow up, Mr. Chairman. Um, that should have never happened. I mean, that easement should have been recorded. So, are we, we are we missing something else here? This could just keep recurring if we don't. I mean, can I don't think it has to be in the bill, but I think somewhere in the rulemaking, uh, order control, some somebody should be making that rule that that has to happen on the real estate transaction at any point it, it gets caught. So, understand if as I'm a licensed uh, realtor, and if I, I would have caught that, I would put it on as an addendum, and I would make sure it got recorded because because what happens is you have a customer that calls you up and says, hey, I didn't realize that this was there. I wouldn't have bought this property or, or, or you know, whatever. So anything could happen. So somewhere we need to catch that. So can you find out, can somebody find out if where we missed that? Because that, that should have never happened. Mr. Chairman, right. we're trying to solve one problem per day, and our problem today is subdivisions. That really is a completely separate issue that is still hanging out there. The challenge is we have many, many ditches in the state of Wyoming that have been there for 150 years and do, do not have written easements on them. So that's a continuous process. We concur with the challenge. This is trying to fix the subdivision process, not the purchase process that would be for another day and another, another bill any further questions committee senator french thank you mr chairman 
whoever might be able to help me out here. I'm having a hard time here. On, on uh, uh, 11, page 11, the, the large acreage subdivision, it goes down through there. And on 21, written documentation from the State Board of Control that the subdivider has submitted to the State Board of Control all documents necessary to voluntarily abandon the water rights. My question is, if I want to sell 30 five acres or 40 acres off my farm to somebody, you know, it's got water rights. I mean, is this saying I have to abandon those or, or can you help clarify that? Mr. Chairman, I'd be glad to. And I rushed the explanation, so I apologize, Senator French. Um, if you sell your 40 acre parcel to someone else, this does not apply. This only applies when that guy or you makes a decision, I'm going to turn this into a 40 acre subdivision and you start the platting process and the permitting process going through planning, zoning, all those kind of things. That's when this applies. So if you choose to subdivide your 40 acre parcel into 40 lots, then you'll go start the process. And if you have water rights, then this applies. So you have to decide one of those four options, whether to abandon, or to transfer the water rights to other places or or to, to lay pipes in the streets so that they can use the water but you, so the developer has to choose one of the four and then you you point out a very key notice the beginning of every one of those paragraphs says written documentation from either the state board of control or the state engineer so that's saying you have to submit the paperwork to them telling them which four the four options you're choosing and they have to process it all, transfer those water rights, do whatever it takes. And then they're going to write a letter to your planning and zoning board and say, thank you very much. The water rights are taken care of. You can proceed with plotting. Uh, uh, follow up, Mr. Chairman. Um, but uh, if I decide to subdivide that 40 acres into five acre parcels, can the water rights stay with that? Because the, the people that may want to buy that five acres wants water to raise some grass for their horses or something. Mr. Chairman, one of the options is to keep the water rights and, On the, and lay either, either cut ditches or lay pipes to every lot so they can beneficially use the water right. We would right. love that. I don't have to vol uh, give up the water That's right. correct. Okay. We, we would uh, love it if they would use the water rights on the lots, especially the larger lots. We, that, that's so much better than trying to use culinary water that's treated from the municipality for right. backyards and gardens. Right. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Any further questions, committee? Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate all your input. Okay, do we have any other state agencies that wanna provide input? Okay, seeing none, uh, any, we'll open up to public comment. Any public comment on this bill? Representative Larson. Oh, yeah, didn't see you there. Come on down. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Good to be in front of you guys. I uh, just want to say I support this bill. Been working on it with, uh, with the entities, the state engineer's office and that for a couple years now. I think uh, there's support out there with the cities, and hopefully they'll get a chance to speak, and uh, I think the county's behind it, too. Okay. Any questions for Representative Larson? Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Any other public comment? Mr. Moline. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Brett Moline, Wyoming Farm Bureau Federation, to be brief. Good idea. Great bill. Support it. It's been sitting, something that's been needed for a long time to help alleviate some of the problems that we currently have. Won't stop what we've got, but it'll keep it from happening in the future. With that, Mr. Chairman, the committee, I'd sit for any questions. Okay, thank you, sir. Any questions for the Farm Bureau? Thank you. Any further public comment? Oh, no, calling down, Mr. Frazier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, David Fraser, Executive Director, Wyoming Association of Municipalities, uh, appearing in support of the bill. This is a 
this is a good bill. It's a well-needed uh, uh, step to be taken. The Select Water Committee did a great job uh, uh, not only engaging the stakeholders, but in, in listening to them and, and, uh, uh, and addressing, in our case, uh, addressing a few, a few concerns we had. And uh, so we, again, support this effort. Uh, Water is a finite resource and always has been. And, and uh, in our drought conditions, it's even uh, becoming a little more finite right now. Hopefully that will reverse itself. But uh, in the meantime, we can't afford to be losing any more water rights. So with that, I'd yield the floor and or take any questions. OK, any questions for Wham? OK, thanks, sir. Any additional public comment? Okay, just check no one else online. Okay, last chance. Public comment is closed. So, committee, what's your pleasure? Move the bill. Okay, moved by cost. Uh, second by Bouchard. Any comments, amendments, committee? We have a pretty thorough uh, explanation of the bill, what it does. Uh, any additional input? Okay. All right, let's do a roll call vote. Senator Bouchard? Aye. Senator French? Aye. Senator Cross? Aye. Senator Wasserberger? Aye. Chairman Bonner? Aye. Mr. Chairman, we have five ayes. Do you pass? Hey, thank you. Uh, Chairman Simpson, who do you have somebody identified to take this on the Senate floor? Or? That would be you. That's me? <laughs> it's the Select Water Committee bill, so it's I'm not Chairman of Select Water. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have three or four members of, well, five members of the Select Water Committee. They're senators. Uh, Senator Hicks probably is the most familiar with it. Yeah, we'll figure it out. Yeah, well, it'll probably be Senator Hicks. Uh, we'll see what happens. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate your input. Okay, next up we have House Bill 73. Uh, Mr. Meeks, come on down if you'd like, or uh, I guess Chairman Simpson, feel free to... Uh, go over this uh, old friend. I, I think you know. I don't know how you do it in the house, but we usually don't go into uh, too much detail on these sorts of bills that have been thoroughly vetted over the interim. But uh, feel free to take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm joined with by me with Jason Mead, the interim director of the Water Development Commission, and uh, we're grateful to present to you the 2022 omnibus water planning bill. You've seen the construction bill. It's already came through your chamber. And now we're presenting the planning bill to you. Do you have this sheet? Very good. I think it's the easiest for us just to focus on this sheet. It gives the raw data that's in the bill and then you can ask questions of the bill. So members of the committee, you've, you've seen the way we do the process. Um, we bring projects on applicants uh, fill out an application they come into the process that's due in march and then our staff goes out and visits those sponsors learns about the project gathers data comes back and then they put together a a scope of services identifying what are the challenges from those municipalities or irrigation districts and then they um, actually hold consultant selection process and they get hard numbers and those consultants are just put on hold with no guarantee until we go through the selection process. So the numbers you see in front of you are hard numbers from consultants to do the work. So let's looking at this uh, spreadsheet then across the top. I want to make sure that you're you're clear as to what those um, you see a on the right hand side wda one wda those are referring to water development account number one water development account number two. Oh, number one is for new development types of projects brand new tribes water development account number two is for rehabilitation projects so if i'm an irrigation district and my pipes are just worn out i'm going to fall into the, the account number two category Water development account number three is for dams and reservoirs. Do you recall that we receive the money into the Water Development Commission as a, there's a, 
a percentage of severance tax income that comes in and it's just sliced right off and put into these three accounts according to statute. Okay, so the projects, you can glance down through them. I'm not gonna take the time to talk about every project, but I would like to highlight a couple that are a little bit unique. Uh, if you see tab G, you'll see an asterisk on it. Um, the bill that you entertained last week had cloud seeding at two locations on it. And every year, I don't know about your chamber, but in our chamber every year, the debate is, how, what are we getting for the value? Is cloud seeding really working? And how do we know? Well, we have four years of data now on the Medicine Bow, Sierra Madre mountain ranges. And we've been monitoring the, the USGS stream gauging stations, and we have an ability to model now with this four years of data. And so we've asked the Water Development Office to produce some results. We want to see, we want to demonstrate to the legislature that their investment in cloud seeding actually is producing X amount of acre feet, more water than what we would have gotten without. So you'll see that um, on item G, tab G, for $300,000, we're going to analyze that and produce some results so we make sure that we're investing in, in a good, good place. I'd also like to have you drop down to tab K. Now you remember, I believe it's two years ago, the Goshen Irrigation District had those horrible collapses that, that uh, threatened to completely ruin all those farmers in that quadrant because they couldn't, didn't have a way to get their, their water. So we've asked the Water Development Office, how many more of those are out there? Do we have aging infrastructure that is ready to collapse so we don't even know about? And so they're, they've suggested that we sponsor a statewide inventory of our older structures and canals and, and tunnels to determine what kind of condition they're in. Are we looking at tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars of potential disasters in the near future? So you'll notice that we've budgeted $500,000 for a reconnaissance study statewide to give us a feel for if there's more disasters waiting out there for us. Those are the two uh, ones that are a little bit unusual and just the normal ones. So Mr. Chairman, I'm going to pause and see if your committee has any questions about the spreadsheet or, or the bill itself. Any questions, committee? Oh, I have one on uh, the uh, aging infrastructure assessment. Is there a, is it safe to assume that would be both phases would be completed within a, a year with within the fiscal year? What's what's the estimated time of completion for that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think uh, with this initial funding, we're planning to complete phase one, and that would mainly be going back through our existing studies um, as a first step to make sure we understand what kind of uh, infrastructure we're dealing with and all along the way trying to define what is going to be critical or criticality um, for each one of these different districts um, and then there will be quite a bit of outreach uh, through uh, meetings and um, and different things like that but then actually putting together a plan of how do we go about prioritizing these projects and then the next phase which is probably going to require additional funding is how do we get boots on the ground and what kind of equipment do we need to actually go in to say a Goshen irrigation district tunnel to determine, you know, are there major problems with it? And we have, is it a ticking time bomb? I think is the term that Senator or Representative Simpson used. So in response to your question specifically, I would anticipate the first phase to probably take um, a year to a year and a half, probably a year and a half to complete. And then we'd uh, reassess where we are at that point and probably request additional funding to actually go out and complete some in the in the field surveys of the most critical structures that were identified in the phase one. Senator Wasberger, go ahead. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just, um, <clears throat> I served on the uh, Select Water Committee when I was in the House years ago. And I guess my concern is, um, there's a dam 
the Laprell Dam that I, I see would be more important than any of these. And I'm wondering um, where that is in the process. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the Laprell, Laprell Dam, we currently have a consultant um, under contract and we've gone out and assessed that. Uh, they're basically putting together 10% designs at this point. Uh, we've had discussions with the Corps of Engineers in regards to permitting um, to move forward. Uh, we've looked at alternatives on which one, you know, can we just rehabilitate the existing dam or is it met its life to where it makes more sense just to move downstream a little bit and, and uh, build a new dam? And we've landed on that option. Um, we do have funding in place through the commission to complete 30% design, but we're also tracking some federal funding that's come through the infrastructure bill that we think is specifically for Laprell Dam. And the governor has uh, written a letter to comply with the requirements of that legislation to request assistance from um, the Bureau of Reclamation to provide that funding. So we are well on our way to trying to get that fixed. It's going to be a, a long process because we're going to eventually have to go through NEPA final design and construction. Uh, NEPA can be a little bit hard to predict, but um, we do have a plan in place and we're hoping that federal funding will come through. Good. Yeah. And as far well, based off of that, um, say the federal funding doesn't come through, would that result in delaying the project at all or are we covered with what we've already approved? Uh, Mr. Chairman, as I mentioned, the funding that's approved so far is just gets us through 30% design. Uh, we do have, or I should say the district, La Prairie Irrigation District has an application and they've done uh, into the NRCS, the Watershed Flood Protection Operations Program. And so that is more or less the backup if we don't receive the reclamation funding. And if that were all to proceed um, favorably, we'd be looking at, I think, a 75% grant potentially from that program. So not 100%, which we may be hoping for through reclamation, but uh, there is a plan B, I guess, at this point. And just follow, I mean, if we don't get any of those federal funds, does this result in a delay in the project? Uh, Mr. Chairman, if there are no federal funds, and obviously when we got to the point, we would need additional funding to complete final design, uh, NEPA. So we would be coming back to the legislature as part of our construction bill. Uh, there's a lot of projects that compete with the rehabilitation program. So those funds are always um, in high demand. And when we get to the actual construction of the project, it's estimated to be somewhere between 60 and $80 million. And our program, the way it sits right now, can't afford that. So most likely, it would be, again, a request for a direct appropriation to that project eventually for construction. So it would be up to the appetite of the legislature on how much that gets delayed. OK, and just, just for planning purposes. So we've expended all the funds that we need to, to get through the planning process. The next step would be construction one way or the other. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would say the next step would be NEPA and making sure we have the perm permits in place through uh, the 404 permits and things like that through the Clean Water Act to make sure we can move forward. Uh, once that's in place, and that might be able to be done simultaneously with continuing on with design. But then, yes, construction would be the next step. So it is a bit of a process to get through that. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I just want to uh, urge you to um, do the most that you can for that dam and, and to uh, approach it with all deliberate speed. And I'm very worried about where we are with that project. And so we need to maybe speed it up a little bit. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the Select Water Committee actually visited that dam this summer. And so we all literally walked underneath it and we walked inside of it and we walked on top of it. And so we understand the urgency and, and I, we're not being held up right now. We are doing step by step everything we need to to progress with it. Okay, further questions to me, Senator French. Uh, real quick, Mr. Chairman, when might, might we get an answer on the prel if we get the I can use ARPA funds or whatever for that dam an answer whether or not we can get federal funds so this is what we're being told the the bil the infrastructure bill 
is coming towards us. And we're told that Senator Brasso, who helped formulate that bill, actually had the Lapel in mind. And as we're looking at the criteria, it falls right in. So we do believe that that's a true innuendo that, that we had some special help there. And so we're, we feel really good about the ability to use the infrastructure money that is for irrigation projects. That's the definition of it. And so right now we we actually feel really comfortable that we'll be able to pull out of that program and get the funding. Any further questions, committee? Okay, thank you very much. Any public comment on this planning bill? Okay, anybody online? Okay, going once, going twice. Public comment is closed. Committee, what's your pleasure? Moved by Senator Cost. Second. Second by Senator Wasserberger. Any additions, corrections, amendments? Okay, seeing no further comment, we'll go. Are you good, Senator? Okay, okay. <laughs> All right, good to know. Okay, we'll do a roll call vote then. Senator Bouchard? Aye. Senator French? Aye. Senator Cost? Aye. Senator Wasserberger? Aye. Chairman Boner? Aye. Mr. Chairman, we have five ayes. Do pass. Okay, do I have a volunteer to take this one on the floor? I can try it again. Okay. Yeah, he, yeah. so far so good, good, Senator French. You go ahead and take it. And, uh, I may have to phone a friend. So. <laughs> yeah, well, you got lots of help. So uh, we'll get re-referred to appropriations and get it up as soon as we can. So let's see. Is Representative Western here? I don't see him. Um, can we, can we, somebody go try to find him or send him a text maybe? Okay, that'd be great. Okay. Um, so we'll we'll wait on House Bill 137 for now. Um, and Representative Eklund, you're here, so we'll go with your bill, House Bill 136. Mr. Chairman and Committee, um, I bring to you House Bill 136. There's a, a, a simple amendment to the statute. This is uh, statute 413-932, and it's, uh, it pertains to control areas. And uh, um, and contested cases in control areas. The, I'll read the one line. And share with you fairly briefly why the bill was brought. In any contested case hearing conducted under this section, the applicant or petitioner shall bear the burden of proof. And that's really all it says. What we have in Wyoming statute is if in any statute there, there is no um, mention of this, this burden of proof, um, when the burden of proof in a contested case isn't specified, the burden of proof is borne by the applicant. And that seems to be fairly universal in, in Wyoming law. Um, we ran into a case where, where this didn't work out quite the way we had anticipated because the attorneys had expected the law to be uh, um, adhered to as it is. And so I bring this as a clarification and uh, a tool to help the engineer's office in, in other decisions that they might be making concerning contested cases in groundwater control areas. And I'd stand for questions. OK, any questions, committee? OK, well, I appreciate a nice, simple bill. Um, so any additional comment you have, you have, um, you have a state agency that like to provide comment at all? Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Gephardt, do you have something or? Yeah, but go ahead. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah, usually how we do it. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Brandon Gilpark, State Engineer. Lisa Lindeman, I'm the Administrator of the Groundwater Division for the State Engineer's Office. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, potential impacts to our agency that I see that this could bring. Um, and I'll also mention that as additional testimony goes on, it may involve a particular contested case that is in front of me. So if that is the case and, and it talks about that case, I will step out just so I, I don't get biased by that. So if I step out, that's why. Okay. But uh, Ms. Lindeman can, can take over at that point. Um, our biggest concern as an agency is the potential for objections to be filed uh, where the validity of the objection is not, not known until well into the case. Uh, and why I say that is it could require our, a lot of resources from these contested cases aren't easy, they aren't cheap, and they take a lot of our staff time. So the validity of an objection is, is fairly important in, in vetting that out to see whether it should be a contested case or not. Um, so the, what the, the statute that this is aman, um, amending, um, it's, it's kind of unique because only in control areas, groundwater control areas, can an application be protested. All other uh, permits are not uh, protestable. So, that, so that's a little bit unique. And then in that uh, statute, it has four elements that are tested in each of these contested cases. And nowhere is injury explicitly identified as uh, a, an element to be tested. It probably baked in there somewhere, but not explicitly. And so um, if, if that's part of the objection, then, then we have to look at the validity of that. But I also wanna say that a control area by its design uh, and state statute protects existing users existing water rights. Um, the control area uh, is, a lot of thought goes into these control areas and it's tried to strike a balance between allowing future development as well as protecting existing rights and the aquifer itself. So that, that's the, the premise behind these control areas. Uh, but, but to my point is, our concern is additional resources if, if, we, if we get a lot of invalid objections. Did you wanna add anything at this point that I messed up? Okay. Okay, any questions for the agency? Okay, thank you for your perspective, appreciate thank it. You. Okay, now come on down, sir. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. I'm Alan Kirkbride. I'm a rancher in North Central Laramie County. Um, Mr. Chairman, committee members, I really thank you for uh, being able to uh, talk to you today. Uh, I will just briefly say that I'm a, a member of this contested case that's been referred to um, because in the in control area where we are, uh, and some neighbors applied for eight high capacity wells in an area about 10 miles long and it's right up above where we have springs it's where there are a lot of other um, they're increasing uh, residential development and the request is we felt it's so excessive we just had to respond and uh, contest it and how, how i'll give you two numbers one is how much uh, water a uh, residential site uses is one acre foot a year. This request was for 4,600 acre feet a year. And they would own, have the, if for, for their uh, eight $50 permits, they would own that water essentially, if granted. And it seemed like the way the uh, state engineer has been going, it pretty much were gonna grant it. Uh, they had everything to gain for 400 bucks nothing to lose really but the 400 bucks we had everything to lose and nothing to gain status quo if we win this prevail we uh get get back the status quo so there were 17 contestees there could have been many more 
because you know, neighbors, ranchers, uh, the springs are very vulnerable. There are springs that are just off the off the uh, edge of the divide where this is. They're obviously fed by the groundwater that's potentially being pumped. And uh, those springs are very much in jeopardy. That's irrigation water that goes down to Merritt and LaGrange, Hawk Springs, Yoder. And those guys are, are, are really interested in this thing. So I, uh, I just, just to say that I appreciate uh, your consideration of this. I think it'll help. I, I'm, I'm not sure that we as, with, uh, with what we felt were very threatened, that, that it was really on us to come up and prove that this was uh, not going to hurt us. I'd take questions. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Kirkbride. Any questions? Go ahead, Senator. Uh, well, uh, at least this is bringing it to light, but uh, maybe I'm, I'm afraid it doesn't maybe go far enough. I mean, we may have to come back and fix this at a later date, it looks like. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Uh, Senator Bouchard, uh, yes, I think there's the adjustments. To, I think we got to look at water a little different in, in, a, in this area of great scarcity time. So we thank you. And so I guess I'm just looking at the bill. Um, it says that this act shall apply to any petition um, or application after the effective date of July 1st. Uh, so it seems like there's already that application that's been put in place. Uh, do you under, are you under understanding that this, this bill would not affect your particular case then? Mr. Chairman, we, we think that's true. Yeah, we understand okay. that. Okay, just making sure. All right. It seemed like sound water law, or sound, a sound thing to do, right. and, and based upon our, our experience. Fair enough. Okay, just want to make sure we're clear. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any further questions for Mr. Kirkbride? Senator French. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, um, so on page two of this line, at the end of line six through eight, in any contested case hearing conducted under this section, the applicant or petitioner shall bear the burden of proof. So the people that asked for the, I don't remember what you said, the eight or 10 well, eight, eight, eight high capacity wells. So, so I can wrap my head around this thing. Um, they would have to prove that it didn't affect the springs or whatever uh, the other side was. Is yes. that correct? Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator French, yes. They would have to, and it's not only springs, it's uh, there are other irrigation users further but east in the anything county. anything that was addressed in the, in the complaint uh, yes. uh, against those high capacity mm -hmm. wells. Well, somebody is going to have to prove it and deal with that. And, uh, and so it seems like it should be them to us. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Okay, thank you for your testimony, sir. Thank you. Any further public comment? Well, Representative Larson, come on down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess I'm coming forward to ask that this be uh, put further into uh, like interim topic. It's pretty major uh, change just all of a sudden. Uh, and we didn't get a whole lot of uh, input from our agency. I do work for the state engineer's office. I'm not in this area. I don't know how deep you want me to go into it, but I would like to show you some information. Yeah. But if you don't, you know, I'd, I'd really like this to be an interim topic is what I was hoping. But do you want me to go into it further? Yeah, if, please say why. Yeah. Okay. I have some hand. Mr. Chairman, I think you all have the map of the uh, Cheyenne area, uh, north and east of, of Cheyenne. 
and it kind of shows you the drawdown areas and uh, conservation areas on the map. So I wanted to make sure you had that. And also, I think uh, I handed out a map of all the monitoring wells that are uh, being monitored by the state engineer's office. And they're online. You can, you could, we could bring it up right now if you went to the state engineer's office webpage. It's kind of hard to get to them, but they do have monitoring wells that they're, they're actively, uh, you can look at them every day and you can see the draw, drawdown. Uh, and you can see when they put this uh, conservation control area in, I think, I want to say 2015, I may be wrong on the date you can see that the water table starts going back up. But seasonally, it's dropping up and down. They also have in the, con con uh, in the conservation area, I think in all, and in the drawdown area, that's the more restricted area, they make them put in a monitoring well when they drill a, a well for their sprinkler or whatever. And if that uh, static water level drops below 20% of, of, of the height, uh, further down, then it's automatically shut off. So I just wanted to make sure everyone knew that. Uh, so I don't know what else to tell you, but uh, I did want to say that Wyoming, uh, Wyoming water law encourages the development of our water. And that's the whole idea. Let's uh, even in our constitution, you know, it's, it's to develop the water and uh, I think it would be detrimental to to have a new, uh, you know, somebody comes and buys some property that they'd have to try to determine that it's, you know, going to cause harm to everybody if they haven't even started pumping. So I don't know if you have any questions, but. Okay, any questions? Senator Burchard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, obviously, this is uh, in, in my county, so I am concerned to what's going on here. Uh, what what's uh, what's the problem if we if we give me the real what you feel is the problem if we don't if if, if we do this because and and I just want to add this I mean, a lot of people think that you know I lived in California but I lived in I I lived in Agland and I can tell you a lot of those wells had to be a lot of wells had to be dug deeper because there there's a serious problem if you're not looking at development. And when people come in and we're seeing, I mean, regardless of what this census has said, we know that there, there's a shortage of properties. There's more building going on. And you start taking wells over a large area and you're going to see drops. And so that is very concerning that we don't end up, you know, making the well drillers a, a, a lot of money because we're, we're not looking at what's going on over, you know, and maybe slowing it down a little bit. So what what is the the real problem here if we pass this bill? I mean, because I mean, everybody wants development and but but I think we want good development. We want to make sure we're not moving too fast and hurting people that have water rights. Personally, I think it's Mr. Chairman, sorry. Thank you. Uh, I think it's a matter of, I, I, like I said before, I don't know how you can prove that you're going to be a detrimental to it until you actually do the process. Um, and like I said before, there is the uh, the twenty percent limit. You know, if you had a hundred foot well that dropped twenty feet, it's shut off. Uh, you know. So I think the I think there's control there already. There's definitely I think you do have the chart on the well spacing requirements already. I don't know if you all have that. It's a red and green chart, yellow. In the in the yep. sure do, yeah. yes. In the drawdown area, you can see uh, if they're uh, greater than five acre feet, they don't even know no permits. They're not going to let it let it happen. So that would be in the blue area. Now, if you take the the green area, they show if it's greater than forty acre feet, you got to be a mile and a half a well uh, from other large capacity wells. 
you know, they say they got the cone of, of drawdown, but but you're a mile and a half away from the other the other wells. I I just would would hope we'd have more discussion so uh, you could hear more input from the uh, the agency. Okay, uh, Senator French. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Rep. Representative. Can you expand a little on you? You said if the wells down there are 100 feet and it's the 20 percent, it drops 20 percent down to 80 feet, it shuts off. But do they do, do they monitor those over? Because you you have an irrigation season, you know those wells aren't running for potentially six months of the year um, if they're used for irrigation. So what happens is, do you have any statistics on if, if during the summer that high capacity well is drawn down, let's say 15% and they, they keep going in the off season when they're not irrigating, is there any uh, statistics on, does that come back up to that 100% level? I mean, is it a up and down, you know, when they're, they're on naturally, they're gonna draw it down. Maybe they don't draw it to full 20%, 15, then in the off season, potentially six months, do those come back up? Do you have any info on those terms? Mr. Chairman, I think on the uh, state engineer's webpage, I think they would show you where they're monitoring their wells. And that's on a, a geo satellite uh, monitor train 24 hours a day, all the way probably through the season, maybe even all year. I don't know. Uh, in these areas also, uh, they, I'm, I'm trying to look through the fact sheet here. Uh, every, uh, all new appropriations, I'm looking here, greater than five feet have to have an annual production. They all have to have a, 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 a <laughs> can't think right now, a meter showing what they've pulled out. Uh, they also must collect and report static water levels annually. To, to the division. So I think I think there's monitoring them. Okay. Senator Bouchard. Mr. Chairman, uh, I mean, I almost feel like we need a whole lot more details that we would almost have to go into an executive session just to see what's going on here. Because I mean, uh, to be fair, I mean, could, could we do that just for a short brief time and Go into an executive session just to get the details of everything because we're looking at this map. We're looking at the controlled area, uncontrolled areas. We don't know the specifics of the case of what what's even going on here so to make a good decision on whether we move a bill forward or not. Well, I, I thought we heard that this doesn't apply to any existing cases. It's I know a it, policy decision, and so I mean, I, I, it's, it, Mr. Chairman, I do understand that. I just, okay. I just still want I want to make an educated decision on. What's going forward? And what exactly would be the information that you'd want in an executive session? And uh, you know. uh, well, I mean, I think part, part, Mr. Chairman, what part of what was said is the engineer's office is here. Uh, the engineer stepped out. Um, Mr. Kirkbride has an ongoing case. I mean, even though this is policy going forward, I think you know the nuts and bolts of what's going on so we can know whether this policy fixes what going forward or anyway just an idea i'm not okay. uh, i'm not pressing hard i'm just right. throwing an idea out there well in my mind it's just a simple question of you know how difficult do we want it to make somebody to develop new water rights in a control area um that's a fairly straightforward question i think and uh um so, I mean, it's a control area for a reason, but it sounds like there's also mechanisms in place to make sure it doesn't get drawn down too much. So, um, that's it. So, yeah, that's, that's the question before us. So, anything else, Representative Larson? Mr. Chairman, like I said before, I think this is a big subject, and I, I would hope we would maybe carry it over and, and discuss it through the uh, interim and, and so we can understand it better. Okay, thank you. Any further public comment? Hello, I'm an attorney from southeastern Wyoming. My family's ranched in Hillsdale and Tysiding since 
1868 um, in Albany County. Anyway, my, I'm an attorney representing a number of the people in the contested case hearing, and I support this bill, and I feel that it should be um, recommended for passage. And I wanted to respond to the state's concerns. Um, first and foremost, this is a bill to protect private property rights, existing private property rights, senior property rights. In a, in a contested case hearing, what we feel should not happen is that the people who have the senior property rights have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to protect their rights when the applicant should be required to show the show what their impact will be to those water rights. So it really is a bill to help protect private property rights. Um, secondly, the state was concerned that this would encourage contested cases and that it would put so much more work on them. However, in order to have a contested case hearing to be a just contester, you have to have standing. That means that you have to show that your water rights will be harmed or an interest that you have in the land will be harmed. So if you don't have that, there is a cost shifting provision in the statutes, and I couldn't remember it off the top of my head, even though I not know these pretty well, but it would shift that back and the state could actually require that person who wrongfully contested a case to have to pay for that. So that would be the protection against, against that. And the third thing is that it is extremely expensive and time consuming to contest cases. People don't do this recreationally. They do it because they have ranches that they have to protect and they have water rights that they have to protect. So this does not encourage anyone in any way to contest cases. The next point is that this actually clarifies existing law. The, ca the case law is very clear. It says that when the statute does not um, say who the burden of proof is on, it's on the person who is the applicant. And if you think about it um, in the sense of like a um, industrial siting application, that person has to produce quite a bit of evidence with their application to get the right to get the right to do their industrial activity. It's the same thing in a water right in a in a control area. And by the way, there's three of them. There's one in there's one in Niobrara County, one in Platte County, and the one that seems to be the most of interest is Laramie County, but they all have the same problem in that the groundwater levels are declining. So this bill clarifies the law. It doesn't change the law whatsoever. It just simply says in the bill that when you're going to apply for a water right, if you go into that and somebody contests it and they justly contest it, then the burden of proof is on that person to prove the four elements of 413932C being that um, there are one that there's unappropriated waters in the in the proposed source, two that the proposed means of diversion or construction is adequate, three that the location of the proposed well or other work does not conflict with any well spacing or distribution regulation, and four that the proposed use would would not be detrimental to the public interest, and that's where harm comes in. You have to show that you're going whether or not you're going to harm other people and of interest this is a really big topic in water law what happens when you pump groundwater it inevitably affects surface water so we have this issue right now where there you pump groundwater and you'll dry up your streams and those are generally very old water rights that are on those so this is a major major water topic pumping groundwater dries up surface water. So if somebody's gonna apply for a groundwater right in a control area, those surface water right holders should be entitled to know what the, what the anticipated impact is and how you show that is through modeling. There are mathematical equations that people use all the time. The state has done a lot of modeling. We have used the models to demonstrate what the harm would be. It, that is a free model. And it only would cost the applicant to run the model with somebody who knows how to run the model. So we had, to, in our case, we had to run the model and it was really expensive. I don't know why it wouldn't be incumbent on the person who's applying for the water right to do that demonstration of the impact. Why shouldn't everybody know what the impact of groundwater pumping is gonna be? Plus we're not talking about stock and domestic wells. Everybody should be able to water man and beast, but we're talking about wells that are larger than 25 gallons a minute. And that that is of concern. And uh, Mr. Larson made a number of points that I don't, that I just will say that he 
made a lot, number of false points, points that were not correct. And um, somebody should, if somebody's interested in clarifying those, I mean, I'd gladly do it, but um, I just want to point that out. And the fourth point is that this bill will not create more work for the state engineer's office. Again, people aren't going to recreationally contest water rights. And it just requires the applicant to produce this evidence. It, it, the statute it's right now says, 413932 says, that the state engineer can only grant these water rights in a, in a control area if he finds all those elements. So in order to find those elements, wouldn't the state engineer need a lot of information, not just a page? Like Mr. Kirkbride was saying that it costs $50 to apply for a water right one page application that doesn't produce any information that would allow anybody to know what the harm would be so really please please pass this bill or re recommend it for passage because it does not change the law it only clarifies the law the case law already is clear that in a contested case the the burden of proof is on the applicant so we're just putting that into the law so that people in the future do not have to go through what these ranchers went through in southeastern wyoming again it will really, it truly will help private property rights holders, water rights holders, ranchers, farmers. It is a really good bill. And other big water right holders, municipalities, if they had to contest. So it's a great bill. There is no need to put this into some interim committee. It is obvious because we're just trying to keep hap from happening what happened again. We don't want some decision to come out that divides the burden of proof in some irrational way. We want it to be clear that in the future, if somebody's going to have to go through this, the applicant has to produce the requisite evidence to satisfy 413932C. And with that, I'll take any questions. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Any additional public comment? Good evening, Chairman Boner uh, and members of the committee. My name is Connor Nicholas. I'm an associate attorney at Bud Fallon Law Offices, and I'm speaking both from uh, the experience in uh, adjudicated administrative law cases as a whole, as well as uh, water control cases as well. I think one of the things that needs to be uh, fleshed out especially is um, what does burden of proof actually mean? And um, I, uh, I gave you all a white paper, um, uh, HB uh, 136 white paper, if you look on page two of that white paper, um, it talks about the uh, burden of proof. And generally what burden of proof is, is there's two, there's two types of, of burden of proof. Uh, first is burden of production. Um, the applicant has to produce everything um, that the statute requires. The second is uh, burden of persuasion. That applicant has to ultimately have the proof of persuasion. So if all things being equal, and it's hard to tell one way or another, um, then the tie goes to whoever doesn't have that burden of proof generally. Um, I think it's important to, to realize as well that every other, um, most, most other uh, contested um, or adjudicated administrative cases, um, that burden of proof is always on the applicant. Um, and so what this law, uh, this bill would really do is it would clarify that the law is consistent with water control areas as it is with any other um, uh, contested case out there. Um, I think that's important to take note. So there is, this isn't a major change. This isn't changing anyone's rights. Um, this is actually um, showing that the rights of an applicant in a water control area is the same as anyone else um, that is trying to apply for a state benefit. The second thing I think is important to point out is um, just the, uh, the purpose of water control areas anyway. Uh, that comes, if you look at page three, um, I, I have the statute listed as to when a water control area um, is created, and that's under Wyoming statute 413.913. And a control area can only be established um, if basically five, five things they show. Um, the use of water, of underground water is approaching a use equal to the current recharge rate. Groundwater levels are declining or have declined excessively. Uh, conflicts between users are occurring or are foreseeable. Uh, the waste of water is occurring or may occur. And finally, um, other conditions exist that may arise that require uh, regulation or protection of the public interest. And so what we're looking at is uh, there's, always, there's already an acknowledgement that the resources is sensitive at this point. 
uh, there's already an acknowledgement um, that we need to take a careful case by case basis and a case by case look at each and every application that comes about. With that, with that in mind, it only makes logical sense that that the applicant should be the one um, who holds the burden of proof to prove each and every one of those. I think at the end of the day, um, what I think I really want you all to to uh, to, to see with this bill is um, first off, it doesn't drastically change the law. In fact, it keeps the law as as it should be, um, as, as we all understood it um, before. I would say an erroneous. Uh, uh, a ruling came about, or I shouldn't say a ruling, but a recommendation came about from a hearing officer. Uh, second, um, it's consistent with uh, what Wyoming uh, Administrative Procedures Act already requires, and it's also consistent with the purpose of uh, water control areas generally. Uh, with that in mind, uh, I'll wrap up my testimony. I know you guys have had a long day um, and be available for any questions. Any questions? Senator French. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So help me out here. If um, it's already in law, then what's the reason for the bill? The, the uh, Chairman Boner, uh, Senator French, uh, the reason for the bill is uh, there is a, there was an erroneous uh, hearing examiner recommendation that shifted that burden of proof onto the contestants, um, i.e. the other uh, landowners in the area that they had to prove that there was water that water was not available, rather than the proof being that there is water available. So that um, that hearing examiner recommendation um, really has shifted what what would have been normal law to what what we're seeing today, and why why this clarification is needed. Okay. Well, follow up based off of that, is there an opportunity to appeal the decision, say to a district court, and it, solve the problem that way? Uh, yes, uh, Ch uh, Chairman Boner, um, that that is correct. Uh, it's actually currently in front of the state engineer today, um, and he hasn't made a decision yet. And yes, it could be appealed to uh, district court. Um, I think this is a much cleaner and more predictable way to to fix it now um, for issues. Uh, rising in the future, but um, it, yes, it, it could be. It, it's it's not that this is irrep uh, irreparable right now, but um, at the same time, uh, as most know, um, sometimes decisions are unpredictable. So you think that this? We just heard that you know this bill would not affect the current case. It seems like you seem to have the opposite perspective. You think it would, if it gets appealed to the district court, the court would look at this uh, new statute and make a decision based off of that. I think it could potentially, um, and, and the only reason I say that is um, at least it shows and it provides clarity that um, the congressional intent, I, I would say from or uh, legislative intent from the very beginning, um, that this wasn't supposed to be any different from anywhere else. However, that being said, um, I, uh, you know, I, I very much believe in uh, prospective laws. Um, I, I don't want people to to um, have their position changed um, midway through, but. Um, I, I believe that what this does is it just shows the law is the same as it always has been. Okay, any further questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any further public comment? Hey, Mr. Moline, come on down. No, nope, you, you, we need to hear from you. Yeah. Well, yep. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Brett Moline, Wyoming Farm Bureau Federation, again, sitting in support of this bill. You know, for reasons already stated, the, the big thing is protect, uh, helping protect current well holders. I, I look at this one as a little bit of a parallelism on the uh, groundwater bill that you folks heard earlier. It was heard in House Ag today that, you know, there was a potential question, does the state really own the groundwater? And that bill helps clarify that, yes, we do. And I think that there's a little bit of parallelism with this bill as it says the bur it helps define where the burden of proof is. And that's a policy decision that you folks have to make, and I'm glad you're on that side of the fence and I'm on this one. But anyway, Mr. Chairman, sitting for any questions for you or the committee. Okay, any questions, committee? Thanks, sir. Any additional public comment? Go ahead and come on down. Yep. You're next, sir. Mm -hmm. 
Yep, go ahead. My name is Alex Bowler, and I'm a, a property owner in the eastern part of Laramie County. I'm also on the board of the Cheyenne Area Landowners Coalition. And I can explain to you what that's about if, it's, if you want to. But, uh, and I also live in the neighborhood of Senator Boucher over there, so I appreciate his comments. There's not a thing in, in this world that is more important to the Wyoming residents than water. It, water is the name of the game. Without water, we're in big trouble. And uh, I had the pleasure, I could call it a pleasure, of sitting through the three days of contested case hearing on, on the uh, contested case that's been referenced before. And uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the applicant's attorney uh, contested basically that uh, since they filed the appropriate fee and dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's on the state engineer's uh, application, that in fact, the, uh, the uh, eight high capacity wells, which would extract 1.5 billion gallons from the High Plains Aquifer that all the contestants use for domestic purposes and watering their livestock. Uh, I th think he thought that uh, because the applicant had basically dotted all the ties, crossed all the T's, paid the fee, that this was going to go through. But this, this particular con situation was so off the wall that it raised the alarm of 17 landowners, surrounding landowners. And um, I'm not going to go into the uh, details of, of what was said and who, which side produced experts to demonstrate that no matter how much water you put on this land, it wasn't going to do anything. Um, I, I do want to address one question as somebody, I think it was Senator French said that uh, you, you irrigate for six months and then you, it lies fallow. Well, that's in Laramie County, that's not really true because there's a, I don't know what the correct terminology is, but there's a temporary diversion of water where the uh, water right owner can sell the water to the oil and gas industry. That kind of extraction goes around year round, 24 hours a day. And it does not provide an opportunity for an aquifer, the High Plains aquifer in this case, to recharge. So uh, on behalf of our um, 285 members, I'm here to tell you that we support this bill and we hope that you'll issue a favorable recommendation. And I try to answer any questions that you Senator might have. Senator French. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was referring to ag operations. I don't know, and I'm a farmer. I don't know any farmer that's out there irrigating when it's 20 below. So that was my reference. Yes. You know, you have a grow, crop growing, you growing season, you know, you put your crop in, you irrigate it, you harvest it. Um, I don't know anybody in my area that's watering when it's 20 below or in, through the winter. That I was referring to ag operations. Chairman Boner, Senator French, from that perspective, you're totally right. But many of our, our landowners in uh, the eastern two thirds of Laramie County, which is the Laramie control area, uh, sell their water to the oil and gas industry. And that pumping, in the case of the section which is immediately to my west at a rate of 850 gallons a minute uh goes on all year round there's no there's no six months off or anything it's all year and it, it really the effect is it doesn't allow the, the aquifer to recharge which is a slow process in and of itself any okay yeah um so are you concerned if we pass this bill my lemon oil and gas development and i uh I believe that uh, it will have very little effect on the, on the uh, water rights ability, uh, owner's ability to sell um, water to the oil and gas industry. It's a phenomenon we have to live with. It's not helping. Uh, and it, uh, this, this provision that puts the, the onus on the applicant is the right direction to go here. So we're in favor of this bill and hope you'll pass it on to the Senate for a affirmative vote oh okay you just follow up on that would you explain why you don't think it would if you put the owners on the people i'm sorry drilling, I'm hard to hearing so if you put the owners on the people drill new wells in my experience in the power of a basin you have to drill new wells to create the substantial amount of water necessary to uh, complete a, a, a well uh, how is that not put a, a burden on the industry 
Well, let me just say that um, we don't believe there's any legal crop that the um, the applicants in the contested case hearing can raise, and uh, and alfalfa is the most water hungry of them all. That uh, can, will compensate them for the cost, which is of uh, constructing and maintaining a high capacity well, which approaches a million dollars. Uh, so it, there, there's an element of of how how this this project, this massive project, could be uh, conducted, and um, so I I don't know if I'm addressing your question or or not, but uh, the, the experience that we've had in the control area in Laramie County is that there's a lot of sale of water going on to the oil and gas industry. Any further questions, committee? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, sir. Any further public comment? Okay. Um, that, anybody else? Say, anybody else want to come up before we close public comments? Okay, Representative Acklin, come on down. Yeah. You know I can be brief, so I'll try to do that. I know you're tired. And you've got other things, to, other bills to look at. One thing I'd clear up concerning oil and gas. Um, there's plenty of plenty of high capacity wells in the area already to supply their needs. They are doing it. We're in the middle of a of a real good oil play out there. And in fact, there's kind of a fight over who gets to sell the water to them because it it's more uh, profitable than farming for sure. Um, I I think this is one little piece needed in some clarifications in groundwater statute. Our founders did only dealt with surface water as we know. Um, and, and I think it can be passed and it makes it consistent with what statute already says. I'm gonna suggest for an interim topic that we look at other cleanups and other things that we can do to make it uh, perfectly clear on that. Um, if, if I had my way, all of my neighbors would be able to irrigate as much as they wanted to. We live on this, it's our high part of the High Plains Aquifer has no stream running through it and no significant way to recharge it. Um, so we know that the water tables, that's why it's a control area. The water tables are diminishing. If you get to the east side, some of those older wells or senior rights holders um, are gonna have to redrill and expand their well, drill it in deeper. And then the junior users, and there seems to be no protection of senior rights holders. This clarification will help those senior rights holders. You, we had testimony, we, we have testimony that there are some springs that used to flow year round. They've, they've begun to dry up. Um, all of my wells are domestic wells. I have no dog in this fight concerning the irrigation. Um, every domestic well that I have has, has had to be redrilled. And it happened after irrigation started in the 60s. And by the 80s, I was redrilling them all. It had to do with this amazing ocean of fresh water we've got underneath us. And, and our predecessors hit water and stopped right there. And they weren't in real deep parts of the aquifer. And the saturation in those aquifers has diminished as well. Um, but I'd like for you to focus really on what the law does, which is uh, maintains a consistency in state law with with what we already do. And with that, I'd, I'd stand for questions. Okay, any questions? Senator French. Mr. Chairman, uh, are those senior water right holders that have a, a well and they have to deepen it like you were referencing, are they grandfathered in? Can they? They have, oh, it's a great deal. They have a senior right. So with my, my wells, they had been registered and they had been in for some of them for uh, 50 to 100 years. The deal you get from the state engineer's office if, if they dry up and you have to deepen them is a new permit to deepen and expand the well. The irrigators downhill from me will get the same deal. And for an irrigation well, it's $100,000 or more 
the uh, domestic wells, I understand, are thirty to forty thousand dollars now. So, um, so it's not necessarily a good deal to to get to redrill them. It is nice that we still have some water left, and and I'd like for for us to protect that aquifer as much as we can. Okay, for the questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, looks like public comment is closed on this one. Uh, do you want to come up? Uh, just one last time. Yeah, let's go ahead. Yeah, come on, come on up. Chairman Boner, <clears throat> members of the committee. Um, the first thing I'd like to point out is that statute 413-931 directs the state engineer to grant groundwater applications as a matter of course. We keep hearing about injury. Injury is not one of the four elements that the state engineer has to consider when approving a groundwater application in a control area. And you've heard this before, but very briefly, what he has to consider is that there are unappropriated waters in the proposed source that the proposed means of diversion or construction are adequate, that the location of the proposed well does not conflict with any well spacing or well distribution regulations, and that the proposed use would not be detrimental to the public interest. Um, the 2015 state engineer's order was put in place to both protect senior appropriators and to conserve the aquifers while allowing additional growth, uh, additional development. We didn't want to put ourselves in a situation where we had another area like, like Pine Bluffs or Carpenter or Albin, where we do have water issues. So that being said, <clears throat> uh, the 2015 order includes 11 pages of findings and fact. Um, we didn't approach this lightly. We collected all the data we could. Um, some of those facts were there is appropriable water in portions of the, of the control area. One of the other findings of fact is there is insufficient water in certain areas, Carpenter, Pine Bluffs, um, and Albin. And our hydrographs do show some drawdown. Um, that goes with development. In developing, and you have a copy of the Laramie County Control Area map and our fact sheet. Um, if, you, if, you, if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer those. But in general, the green area is what we call the conservation area. That area has been determined through modeling, through static water levels. We did, I think, two rounds of measuring over 200 wells in the area, collecting static water levels, all the data that we could compile, modeling and everything else. The green area, the conservation area, will withstand additional development. And again, the control areas are a little unique in that these are the only areas where when somebody submits an application to us, we do publicly advertise them and people can protest them. Um, then it goes hopefully into mediation, if not into mediation, a contested case. But at the end of the day, if there is injury, we can't predetermine injury, but if there is inj injury, an appropriator can claim, file a claim of interference under statute 413911 for a whopping $100 filing fee. And so, so they have that recourse, okay? And like I said, if there's any questions on um, the fact sheet or the map, uh, please note that any new well that goes into the control area, there's spacing requirements, there's annual static water level measurements, um, there's a possible monitor well for some of these wells. If you're going to drill a production well, you may have to drill an additional monitor well to collect additional data. Um, as, as Representative Larson correctly noted, if there's a reduction of 20% in the water column in a well, then you're automatically shut off. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. Um, there's metering and reporting, and um, uh, each, each new well, other than domestic stock or miscellaneous less than 25, have to be adjudicated, as well as existing wells in the, in the control area. By adjudication, I mean it's a, it's a perfection of a water right where we actually go out, we do a field inspection of the, of the point of diversion, your well. We look at where it's being applied, make sure that everything's compliant with a permit. So there, there, there should alleviate a fear of somebody out there just using more water than they're permitted for. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, any additional questions? Hey, thank you very much. Thank you.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we've taken about an hour of public comment on this issue, so we'll go ahead and last chance. Okay, public comment is closed. Committee, what's your pleasure? Okay, move the bell. Any discussion, committee? Senator Bouchard. Mr. Chairman, I, I just want to add, and I want to take it to, over to a totally different subject, so that way we're not talking about water for just a minute. And I thank God that we don't have a lot of the other regulations that other states have, but when you come in with a new project or something that could be substantial, you have to provide the calcs. It's, you know, it's your, you have the burden to do that as you come in. So I, I look at that as, it's okay. I mean, because, the, the, you know, that person has to provide the, the money. And when we talk about the, 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 the oil water, there's farmers doing that in our area, making money with selling that water. So that stuff's already been divvied out, I think, you know, as far as the oil and gas development. And so, I mean, I'm not worried about that, that as much when that was brought up, but when somebody comes in, they got to provide that burden of the calcs. I think that's all that this does, you know, and on, that's how it works on different development, nothing to do with water. So does that make sense? So I, that's why I support the, the bill. Yep, understood. Any further comment? Senator French. Does this, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Does this open the door for a contested case hearing on it? any well that's proposed i mean are we you know people oh somebody's going to drill a well going to contest that thing um is there a risk here of that well senator i say it's uh, tough to say um it certainly heightens the standard for uh, applying for new development i would say and I'm not going to speculate as to whether it's going to have a chilling effect even. And so maybe there'll be fewer cases to contest uh, on a new development. So I, I think the policy decision we have here is, uh, you know, how to balance the rights of everybody in a control area where there's already a limited resource. Do we want to uh, put that burden on the person applying to develop water or do we want to uh, 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 kind of tilt things towards folks who have existing water rights? That's the question before us as to the effect in, in terms of the number of cases. I, I, I can't answer that. But. Fair enough. Yeah. Any further questions, comments? Okay, let's do a roll call vote. Senator Bouchard. Aye. Senator French. Aye. Senator Cost. Aye. Senator Wasserberger. Aye. Chairman Boner. Aye. Mr. Chairman, we have five ayes, two pass. Okay, I'm sure this will be a lively debate on the floor. Um, so we like litigating stuff in the legislature. So, okay, Representative Western, sorry for the delay, you're up. Chairman Boner, committee members, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. And I apologize for being late. I had to uh, uh, present a bill on uh, first reading in the House. Um, so the reason this bill is here is, is quite simple. It's a transparency bill. Right now, the land exchange process more or less goes as follows. Uh, a private landowner who wishes to acquire state land submits an application for, uh, for an exchange to OSLI. It then goes through this process that can take a year, 18 months, or even more to go through internal review, et cetera, before the public finally knows about it. And so, again, this is not a bill on whether uh, these land exchanges are good or bad. It's just simply about making sure the public is included. Because by the time they are included in this process, it's about 18 to 24 months in, and much of the public, when they are disclosed, the overall sentiment is, well, wait a minute, I feel like I've been kept in the dark this entire time. This bill intends to just simply say, hey, let's all be on the same page at the same time. So, I mean, that's that's the basic gist of the bill, uh, and I stand up for any questions. Okay, any questions for Representative Western? So you can say that it's meant to increase transparency, it's not necessarily an opportunity to 
stop the land exchange process, but to simply let people know, the public know, that it is in the works. And as the LSLI goes through that uh, long process, at least folks will be aware that that is going on. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, you, that is correct. It just simply just says, hey, this is happening in your area. Uh, and I appreciate that some folks might be concerned about an additional administrative burden. I, I, all we're talking about is here is simply just putting a notice saying, hey, an application has been submitted within 30 days and a, and a big notice on it that says this hasn't gone through the internal vetting process or to see if it fits any of the criteria. It's simply been submitted and it hasn't been vetted through the process. So that's that's all in terms of it administratively uh, that it ultimately requires. So uh, again, these lands are, are lands that are owned by the state of Wyoming and taxpayers. And as we all know, there are some, some chunks of state land that are extremely valuable. And it's not that they shouldn't be considered for exchange, it's just ensuring that we are all on the same page at the same time, so. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions for the sponsor of the bill? Okay, thank you, Representative, I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, we have the state lands here, come on down. Thank you for your patience, appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, Jennifer Scoggin, Director of the Office of State Lands and Investments. With me is Deputy Director Jason Crowder. Um, we have a couple concerns with several aspects of the bill. And really our position is timing is everything. Um, certainly we want to have public notice and public comment, um, but sometimes these things are a little bit tricky. Um, with this bill, the board would be required to post notice of each proposed land exchange within 30 days of receipt of the application. Um, we believe this could actually have a chilling effect on the number of exchange proposals that the board might receive in the future. It takes time um, to have conversations between the staff and the proponent um, to discuss whether there's, there's even a deal to be had. Sometimes we get people that put in an application, there ha hasn't been a discussion about, is this something that um, the office or the board might even be interested in? And, and as, as I know, yes, these are um, lands that are held in trust uh, for the trust beneficiaries, which is K through 12 education. So that's, you know, when we're looking at these land transactions, largely that's what we're looking for is, is this in the best interest of um, future revenue generation and the other um, trust management principles that the board has us abide by when we look at these transactions. Um, it's been our experience that most applicants prefer that their application be kept quiet until they know whether the board is interested um, and the staff is going to pursue something a little bit further. They don't want their business out in front of everybody. Um, the applicant uh, would also be required under this statute to provide um, documentation evidencing value. And of course, I'm assuming that means in the form of a, an appraisal or something of that nature. And most people don't want to incur that expense of an appraisal um, prior to knowing whether there's even a deal to be had here. Um, Further, we believe this bill is a little bit inconsistent with the um, provisions of the Public Meeting Act, which um, deals with executive sessions. Um, currently, Wyoming Statute 16.4.405A Romanet 7 um, would allow the Board of Land Commissioners to consider the selection of a site or the purchase of real estate when the publicity regarding the consideration would cause a likelihood of an increase in price. So oftentimes, dealing with the state, we're not as nimble as private parties and individuals when you're talking about real estate transactions. We have to analyze it. We have to go through the public comment period. We have all of those requirements, um, which again, take time. The danger is, is if the information is out too early, um, the opportunities for others to swoop in and grab the deal to say to an applicant, hey, we can get this deal done with you right here. We'll do it for this. Um, so it could influence the deal. There's also opportunities for shenanigans where people um, start um, buying real estate within the area, which may drive the price up, which again, then could influence whether or not it's a good deal for the trust beneficiaries. So that's why um, we believe it's important for the board to have a quiet time. Um, it's a period to consider a proposal and then make it public at the appropriate time to have the public weigh in. And we believe that our current process allows that. And we've brought some handouts with us that um, one of them is a flow chart, which kind of takes you through our current process. The other is, I think it's a, a snapshot of what's on our website currently with respect to um, the pending transaction 
transactions that we have. So with that, I would turn it over to Deputy Crowder to kind of take you through our current process and explain um, where the public input and notice comes in. Hey, Mr. Crowder, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the process is rather lengthy, as the Representative Western mentioned. Uh, what we have is we get an application submitted to us, and it's not a, a formal application. It's a general set of questions that we ask the applicant to provide their perspective on what the transaction would look like. It talks about all the attributes of the parcel, the um, uh, revenue generating opportunities that may exist there, the habitat, how the land is currently being used, how neighboring lands are being used. And it does ask for a general sense of value, but again, and this is 100% uh, the applicant's perspective of the transaction and not anything that we hold as fact. Uh, as the bill uh, mentions the requirement of OSLI providing an application, right now that's not what we do. Uh, the application is just simply a starting point for a, a discussion to understand what this transaction could be and if it has any chance of meeting the trust land management objectives as the director mentioned. Uh, once we receive that in-house, uh, we place it on what we call a category one list. It can stay on that category one list for up to a year. And the reason for the timing of that is that we don't manage applications on a first come first serve basis. We manage them on a priority basis. So which application um, uh, that comes in has the best opportunity, the most opportunity to uh, benefit the trust land management objectives and the beneficiaries, and we will concentrate on those first. We also have to prioritize staff time. We have a limited amount of appraisers, a limited amount of uh, field staff, and a really limited amount of real estate staff that can analyze these things. Um, so we, we park them in a category one status for a year to, to try to fit in that priority scheme. And if they don't, they simply go away and um, we try again some other time time. However, uh, if they do appear to meet the trust land management objectives, uh, we provide them to the director in a, in a review with the limited information that we have and, and with the perspective from the applicant to see if they do meet those trust land management objectives. And it's up to her at that point to decide if to move it to a category two status or not. Once it's on the category two status, um, it can sit there while we are moving through the uh, appraisal process, the initial board approval process, and the detailed analysis process. Uh, but what we do is we prepare a very preliminary detailed analysis, and on your flow chart, it does say prepared a detailed analysis, and the word preliminary should be in there as well, because obviously we don't have enough information for the full detailed analysis. But we provide that to the Board of Land Commissioners in the executive session, and they too get to determine if the transaction, just on the merits of uh, the perspective of the applicant, and what little we can provide at this point in the game, um, if they meet the trust land management objectives or not, and if they feel like it has that merit, then they tell us to provide it to them in an open public session. And at that point, they will vote and consider uh, the transaction and tell us to move forward with the analysis process or not. And that's all they're doing at that point, is just telling us to move forward with the analysis process. It's not a final consideration of the transaction, but it allows us to move forward with negotiating the agreement to initiate the exchange. It allows us to move forward with any appraisal um, processes we need to go through and, and to also complete that full detailed analysis. And like I said, that is an open public meeting. And once the board approves us moving forward in that um, period, we place it on the website uh, open for the public to, to view. So obviously it's on the board's agenda as, as public view, and then we place it on the website. And, and as the director mentioned, we provided you with a screenshot of our website, and it doesn't do a good job. It's a printout of a page, so you'll, you'll do a better job of understanding what, what we have on our website if you actually go to the website. But, but you can see that it talks about um, the land transaction process, uh, how we do it, and I highlighted uh, exchanges under consideration. And those are all the exchanges under consideration currently today. Uh, as you can see, we have the application on there, we have the board matter on there. If a resolution was signed, we have that on there. And then, uh, as you'll note, uh, any public comments that might be received um, during a certain uh, portion of the process. That's all out there for the public to view. And again, that could happen uh, within days of an application coming in. It could happen within weeks, and it could happen after a year. But it all happens after the board has had that initial and the office has had that initial screening period to see if there's any merit to this uh, application meeting the trust land management objectives. 
to move forward through the process, obviously we uh, publish a detailed analysis and that detailed analysis brings in all the information of a particular transaction. Uh, any attributes of the parcel, again, um, any revenue generating potential, the value of the, the property, any appreciation potential, just anything that we can pull in. In that detailed analysis, we also borrow expertise from sister agencies like the Game and Fish Department, uh, the State Parks Department, and others and then provide that out to the public. Uh, we give the public 60 days to uh, provide written comments back to that uh, detailed analysis. We also hold a hearing uh, within that 60 day period in the county where the, the transaction is taking place and solicit uh, verbal comments at that time. Once that 60 day period is over, uh, we provide all of those comments along with our detailed analysis to the Board of Land Commissioners. And at that point, they make the final decision if a, a transaction should move forward or not. But I think what I want to highlight about the application process is, is that there are three different perspectives that are brought into each transaction. First, with the application or that beginning of the discussion, we get the applicant's perspective, solely the applicant's perspective to us. And then we're able to provide the office's perspective to that, the fiduciary perspective, the, the one that meets the trust land management objectives, the measure against that. And then the public perspective is brought in. And that's when um, people like the sportsman or just the general public and, and everybody else can bring their perspective into the transaction. So we bring them all in uh, at the end, uh, bring them all together for the board to consider. But each one is allowed its own internal um, um, unrestricted, I guess, review of the transaction as we move forward with the process. So, Mr. Chairman, that, that is the process, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you for that overview. Any questions for State Lands? Senator French. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is there any uh, way that, like, uh, written public comment or anything, instead of being just in front of the final board decision, um, be backed up in this process at all to uh, address uh, Representative Western's concerns. And I, I understand, you know, it, it, you, you're limited, maybe not right at the very start where it's just initial, hey, I wanna, I'm interested in that state 40 over there that is in the middle of my ranch or something, you know, and maybe it, it falls apart or maybe it goes on but is there any way to back this up a little bit to address uh, representatives' concerns? Um, Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator French, I, I think that's a great question. The reason it's placed where it is is that it is the point in time where all of the information is pulled together. It's in a transaction that uh, the office feels meets the fiduciary responsibilities of the Board of Land Commissioners, and that it's something we can provide to the Board of Land Commissioners with a positive recommendation. A lot of detail, in fact, go into developing that transaction at that point. And if we were to provide uh, the opportunity for the public to comment on something different than that, then they're commenting on facts of a transaction that may not ultimately be the transaction. Um, so we want to make sure we're giving the public the full picture, the, the exact thing that the board will be considering, and not something that could have an opportunity to change and be adjusted um, after they've seen it initially and, and perhaps change the game on them. Any further questions, committee? Senator Cost. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The question I'd ask is, do you think that um, putting some kind of a time period on there, six months or whatever, to get to a point where you could actually start down the full process would expediate that? Or do you see that as uh, more of a trouble than uh, a step up of let's move this along? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Senator Cost, I guess I'm not sure. Uh, each transaction is really different. Uh, like Senator French mentioned, we have the just 40 acre transactions that are simple. And as the committee's aware, we did pass rules or the Board of Land Commissioners passed rules for an expedited land exchange to move those 
small ones without much public influence or, or interest much quicker through the process. Um, but we also have large ones. Um, as Representative Western mentioned, there are large, uh, high-valued property that take a lot more time to analyze. And there are a lot of good ones that do get stacked up, but with the limited staff resources that we have, we just simply can't get through all of them in a, a very quick amount of time. So I don't know if restricting the amount of time really helps this process, because what we want to do is have successful transactions. We want to have successful transactions for the benefit of the beneficiaries um, and for anybody else that might be a participating party in the transaction. And to be able to do that under a time frame may limit our success at times. Any further questions? Well, I have, so I, have you ever met a circumstance where you go through all this work and then the public outside cry is so great that the Board of Land Commissioners doesn't approve it? Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, we have one of those now. It's not that the board hasn't approved it, but they've asked the um, stakeholders, if you will, to go and see if um, middle ground can be had to see if um, maybe a, a little bit of a tweak on the proposed transaction that the applicant has proposed and would agree to um, if there's something there. And so it's not just that the cake's already baked. I think the way um, with with the public hearing, the board gets a sense of kind of how the public is feeling about it. Um, then when it is um, uh, time for the final board discussion, um, there's an opportunity for those um, uh, folks, whether they've made public comment or not, to appear and make additional comment and explain their concerns to the board. And the board has been very willing to listen to them. And as I mentioned in, in one instance right now, they didn't just simply pass it. They've asked for more information, asked for the, the folks to kind of get together and see what can be done. Right. I'm just wondering if you're worried about staff resources want to be beneficial to understand if something right out of the, ba right out of the gate isn't going to uh, go anywhere because it's uh, wildly unpopular. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't your agency appreciate that knowledge at the beginning of the process instead of jumping through all these hoops and, and wasting staff time on something that doesn't end up being executed? Thanks, Mr. Chairman, for that question. I'd, I'm going to pull it from another example where the board did deny a transaction we placed in front of them, and it was one in the Laramie Peak area where it did have a fiduciary benefit. It was a slim one. And so when the board weighed the amount of uh, public um, impact against the fiduciary benefit, they decided it just wasn't enough to move forward. Um, in that case, we were able to provide or have the ability to provide that fiduciary benefit to them without being influenced by things that are not part of the trust land management objectives. So the, the members of the public in the example that the director mentioned and in the one from Laramie Peak are specifically sportsmen and they don't have a revenue generating seat at the table currently. And while their use of the land is important and it is allowed and, and it's something that the board wants to hear, they don't provide that fiduciary uh, impact that we need to provide to the transaction or to the, the Board of Land Commissioners. So uh, having them influence the process early without having that revenue generating component or that for fiduciary perspective too soon, it, it may be problematic. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, any further public comment? Ms. Riagna, come on down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jim McGagan with the Wyoming Stock Growers Association. To start a discussion like this, I think it's always important that we remember that these are not public lands. They're state trust lands. The primary responsibility is the management for the good of the beneficiaries that the lands were granted to the state uh, to benefit. And with, with that in mind, first of all, I would, I would offer that uh, we fully concur with the concerns expressed by the Office of State Lands, the director, in terms of this being a disturbing way to move forward and how it interferes with the process. Um, that filing an application for a land exchange is really, for many people, just a very exploratory process. And I can say that for a couple of reasons. In my position with stock growers now, because I am a former director of the Office of State Lands, I get numerous calls from landowners who have 
parcels of state land within their ranching operations that they would like to trade for something and they're looking for advice and what I know from getting those calls is that it's it's a very open process it's an exploratory step that they're taking uh, in some instances and one in fact that I've just visited with recently uh, they have a piece of state land that would make sense from them to acquire they don't feel that they have any private land of their own that would fit for the state to offer as an exchange. So what they're looking at is they've talked with a third party about the possibility of acquiring a piece of land that they feel might have some appeal to the state. Well, if they're required to disclose at this early step of the process that they have a tentative private deal with another private party, that uh, very likely destroys that whole process. And one of the things that we found in, in doing an exchange with the state, yes, it's a value for value basis, but it's more than that. Uh, the state land office, the Board of Land Commissioners looks to say, does this piece of land that we're going to acquire have some potential for greater future revenue to the trustees rather than maybe just the, the regular grazing revenue that's coming off of it, if it's grazing land or crop revenue, if it's crop land. So, uh, one of my pieces of advice to a party that's interested in doing an exchange is visit with the state first, file your application, get a sense of if you've got three or four pieces of land that you might be able to offer in trade, which of those would have some particular appeal above just value today, but appeal to the, to the Board of Land Commissioners because they see some potential for what could happen on that land in the future. And that's all a part of this very exploratory process. And uh, in the interest of time, Mr. Chairman, I would simply suggest and recommend to you that, uh, that you not move this bill forward. And perhaps an area that could be looked at, as, as Mr. Crowder explained, there's a very definite point when a piece of land, an exchange is moved into what's termed category two. That's when both parties are getting serious about it. And perhaps at that point, instead of just posting it on the, uh, off of state lands website, a more aggressive program at that point in time to make publics, particularly publics in that area, more aware of it through local media or what, whatever tools might work best for that. But that would be a better approach to addressing the concern of, of public information than moving the public disclosure clear up to the front when there really isn't a, a proposal necessarily, a, a firm proposal even out there. And, and finally, Mr. Chairman, I, I would have to point out that in the in the particular case that was mentioned that has given rise to, I believe, this legislation coming forward, in fact, the public uh, uh, input was successful to this point in stopping the proposal from moving forward, even though there was, on a strictly financial basis, a clear benefit to the trust beneficiaries had that proposal been approved by the Board of Land Commissioners. So I, I think while there can be improvements, most certainly, I don't feel that the case that's given rise to this uh, builds the argument effectively for moving forward with this legislation where there's your no vote. That, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to take any questions. Any questions for the stock growers? Okay, thank you, thank sir. You. Any further public comment? Okay, anybody online? Okay, going once, uh, Representative uh, Western, come on down. Yeah, come on down. Yep. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just kind of maybe wanted to bring it home real quick. Mm -hmm. So one of the concerns is that you know, during this time of, you know, during phase one, parts of phase two, during this time of secrecy, the concern is that there have been instances where applica uh, applicants have abused this, this lack of transparency. Uh, with certain cases with ranchers, oil and gas companies. And so that's part of the concern there is that there are folks, not all of them, but there have been instances um, where applica uh, applicants has taken advantage of this lack of transparency in the application process. Uh, some folks feel that this will have a chilling effect on applications. I don't, I don't think so. You know, these applications, good ones anyway, can withstand that public scrutiny uh, and, and move for, uh, through that entire process. Uh, when you submit these things, it's not like you're just kind of throwing darts at a board. If you're a smart applicant, you're going to hire an attorney who can kind of get a good sense of saying, okay, this is the criteria, these are the lines we're looking at. We're pretty sure that this is going to meet all that criteria and that, that the, um, the OSLI will agree with them. Uh, and, and 
To be sure, this bill does not prevent uh, any unrestricted review or consideration of these applications. Uh, the Office of State Lands, all the, the applicant, they can do everything they're already doing. All just simply is saying that, the, that there is a disclosure at the beginning of the process. And, and, and Senator French, you, know, you talked about, well, you know, how can we maybe move the public component of this up in the process? This bill does exactly that uh, and ensures that, that this is done in a transparent and way and ensure that we're all on the same page uh, at the same time. Um, you know, when you look through the, the, the public comments on these things, when they do get disclosed, almost without exception, the top comment is, I feel like I've been kept in the dark the whole time. Why haven't we been included earlier? Um, again, there absolutely can be discussions or ex explorations by applicants. They can make informal calls to the office about, well, what about this piece of state land or what do you guys, you know, this piece of, of fee land or private land? Those kind of things can absolutely happen uh, prior to this application and this bill does not prevent any of that. Um, the analogy I'll, I'll leave you guys and wrap it up is, is this. Imagine if a bill comes before a committee, goes through the House through three readings, comes to the Senate, goes through the committee process, and all that happens in secrecy. The public does not know. And only once the bill hits third reading in your chamber, then finally the public is aware that this is even happening. I mean, if that happened, that would be unconscionable, right? That, that their public doesn't know that this bill is working its way through a body. Same thing with this application process. You can't say, uh, all we're saying is that it needs to be transparent in a way that the public knows from square one and keeping us all on the same page at the same time. So thank you, committee. Okay, hey, any final questions for the sponsor? I have one just about when they post it on the website. It, I don't see any requirement in the bill that you have to post the, the proposed value of the lands or anything like that. There won't be any of the details in there. What there are, or it would just be saying, what, what do you imagine the information being uh, um, as part of that public notice? Mr. Chairman, uh, that is, is not specified by the bill. And, and obviously, this bill is in, is in your committee and for your consideration. And should you choose to amend it to include that, that is at the discretion of the committee. Okay, yeah, just, I just, I'm not interested in doing it. I just want to make sure that everybody understands that it's not as if we're, we're divulging uh, sensitive information with the posting or anything like that. That would prevent the, uh, the application from moving forward or, or uh, otherwise trip it up. It's just simply stating. Correct. I imagine just a legal description of the lands proposed. Is that correct? Or Correct. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Representative. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. With that, uh, public comment is closed. Hey, what's your pleasure? Okay, moved by Senator French. Any discussion? Okay, can we go ahead, Senator Cost? Yeah. Well, I have one concern, and that is uh, it is state lands, and obviously if word gets out at the wrong time or whatever, that could create some real issues with the price or whatever. And so... Uh, both up or down in some cases. I'm not saying good or bad. My my concern would be uh, to make sure that we provide some integrity to the value as we work through that. And I don't know exactly where, but maybe if we were to look at some kind of amendment as once it, once it reached category two or whatever, you have 30 days to get public notice out or something. Something like that might be more appropriate than just the 30 days in there. That's, I'm not making that, I'm just saying that might be something for us to think about. Yeah, absolutely. We got a nice nice flow chart that gives us a couple options here. Um, and a committee will see my name is on the bill. Uh, I can tell you my uh, interest in it has to do with the a situation in my neck of the woods where, uh, frankly, an oil and gas company is threatening to do an exchange in the middle of somebody else's property. Actually, probably technically Senator Wasserberger's uh, constituents and using that as a, near as I can tell, a negotiating tool to get a better price uh, from that private landowner by threatening to basically become a landowner in the middle of their property. It's an abuse of our laws. That, that, you know, there's laws that deal with eminent domain that deal with um, uh, that uh, deal with uh, split state situations that they're completely avoiding by abusing this process. And so uh, I understand there's different issues in different parts of the state. It, uh, it's not just a power over basin issue. And I think that's, that's why I see the need for the bill. That's why I'm a sponsor. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's important that we move it forward if we want to have that discussion as to, you know, whether we move the public notice back a little bit further in the process. I think that's a good discussion to have.
Um, but I think we do need to have this discussion because of the uh, manner in which this process is, is being abused currently. Uh, there's just no way for the public to know until it's right, like Representative Western said on their equivalent of, of third reading. So any further comments? Okay, um, seeing none, we'll go ahead and do a roll call vote. Senator Bouchard? Aye. Senator French? Aye. Senator Cost? Aye. Senator Wasserberger? No. Chairman Boner? Aye. Mr. Chairman, we have four ayes, one no. Do you pass? Okay, I'll go ahead and take this one. Uh, Representative Eklund, do you have a preference to be the floor manager on your bill? Who would you like to be the floor manager on your bill? Okay, we'll figure it out. Or, and, uh, yeah. Okay, sounds good. Okay, any further comments? Okay, thank you, committee. We are adjourned.